Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Casey Salandra, and I'm part of the Education Committee's uh, AOC PM&R uh, Resident Council. Um, I'm so excited to be here today to continue our series on exploring the different fellowship options available for PM&R residents. Um, it is my privilege to be joined today by Dr. Kentaro Onishi. He's the program director of the Sports Medicine Fellowship at uh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Um, so Dr. Onishi is a physiatrist and board certified sports medicine doctor. He received his medical degree at Western University of Health Sciences and completed his residency at UC Irvine. Um, following residency, Dr. Onishi completed a sports medicine fellowship at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He is currently an assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and director of the PM&R Sports Medicine Fellowship at UPMC. Um, Dr. Onishi has over 40 peer-reviewed publications. He's been involved in the 2018 Winter Olympic Games and played a vital role in preparation for the International Olympic Committee ultrasound program at the 2021 Tokyo Summer Olympic Games. Um, we are so thankful to have you, Dr. Onishi, here with us today. Um, so my first question for you, um, I just want to start by asking about your journey into sports medicine. How did you get interested in sports medicine? And can you just describe your journey to becoming a sports medicine program director for a fellowship? Sure. Well, thank you, first of all, for your kind introduction. Um, and second of all, um, yeah, uh, of course, I'm happy to answer that question of how did I get interested in sports medicine and my pathway to sports medicine? Um, you know, I think that maybe in this type of interview that you're looking for um, something that's more typical, something, something that people can relate to, but I'll tell you off the bat that my pathway to sports medicine is very atypical, including where I come from. Um, I was born and raised in Tokyo, Japan until age 20. And I have never, I had never spoken English until age 20 or so. Um, and somehow I decided that I wanted to pursue my college um, study abroad in the United States. And the reason was obviously the sports is a huge part of American culture. And I wanted to be the best sports medicine physician I could be. And I thought, all right, well, if I were to, you know, go uh, pursue this dream of becoming a sports medicine physician, I better go to the country that has arguably one of the biggest sports industry in the world. So that was kind of like a go big or go home mentality that decided to somehow overlook the fact that I had to learn new language and, you know, get adjusted to the new culture uh, coming from Japan. Um, and that's kind of how I decided. That's kind of how, you know, I pursued it. Um, but the reason I pursued sports medicine had a lot to do with my upbringing. And um, I um, was probably like a tiny level going on to 11, um, getting ready to graduate from elementary school. And um, I was uh, very obese. <laughs> um, I used to play lots of video games and um, never really loved playing any sports stuff and um, as a result I gained weight and um, I was a really large kid in this little city called Tokyo and um, decided that I you know you know my my father decided to tell me that you know you gotta start losing weight so then I decided you know maybe I should start running and really didn't have a choice my father kind of basically made it so, so that basically if I don't run that day then I don't get to eat <laughs> so the following three um, years from that time on I kind of was forced into running every day and then you know my father eventually would go on to becoming the CEO of a Japan airline uh, but obviously he's a workaholic and he would never be home until like super late at night and he would come in check in with me and if I hadn't run and sometimes that means that I get to um go run around 9 p.m., 10 p.m. with my father's, you know, supervision. Um, and over three years or so, I basically lost weight. And by the time I lost weight, I was a quite runner. So then I uh, ended up picking up on track and field and cross country and ended up doing well. And along the process, I made friends that I never really thought I would make. And I realized the power of sports is amazing. And, and you know, um, 
I, I thought that, you know, if I could help people uh, to do what they love, because I realized that, you know, social aspect of being a part of a sporting community is huge. So that's kind of how I decided that, you know, I want to help people who play sports um, just because I, I believe um, sports medicine connect uh, sports, I guess playing sports allow people to connect and meet people. And that's kind of what life is about. So, you know, although sports medicine is kind of that, you know, black swan in PMR fellowships, it's really not that much different than, you know, spinal cord injury folks, you know, um, advocating for uh, quality of life for people who sustain spinal cord injury. Um, we are advocating for improved quality of life uh, for those who embrace sports as part of their identity. So um, that's kind of how I decided to go into sports medicine. Yeah, that was really well said. And what an interesting story. Are you still a big runner? I am. In fact, um, I'm heading out to run right after this meeting. So okay, do you <laughs> marathons or more of a sprinter? Uh, distance running. Um, so um, I ended up competing in Division One cross country at wow. Pepperdine University when I first came to the United States, and that really helped me to obviously to bridge um, uh, the time that rough edges during when I didn't speak English. Yeah. Um, they, they at least, you know, see me running and doing my best. And even though this guy doesn't utter a word that they understood. And, and it, the funny story that time was, um, like I started running, but then I didn't really realize the practice it happens in the afternoon. And I didn't, you know, clear out my class schedule. And at that time, my college required us to take PE class. So PE overlapped right in the middle of the practice. Um, so then I would show up to the warm up and then tell my coach that I have to go to PE class and then I'll be back in one hour. But because the way I said it, uh, they thought that I was going for one hour of a peeing uh, restroom pee. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but then the coach is this old school guy, doesn't say much, you know, and he thought that, you know, maybe I have the weird hygiene habit coming from Japan, so respected me and didn't say a word, but the entire season, they thought that I was going for a pee for one hour. Oh my God, that is too funny. That's so nice that he respected it though. Wow, yeah. but oh my gosh. It's this like 80 year old man, you know, it's super yeah. nice. He's like, yeah, he probably comes from Japan, does this weird thing, it's probably part of the culture, won't say a word. Oh that is funny. Okay, awesome. So my next question is just, um, you know, we, we know that there's a couple routes to get to sports medicine. So I was wondering, um, why did you choose PM&R specifically? And um, what aspects about being a physiatrist do you think really, really help you in your sports medicine practice? Yeah, it's similar to what I've kind of alluded earlier. I'm always excited to be part of a sort of improvement of someone's well-being and like I said you know spinal cord injury individuals or stroke you know people who are affected by strokes trying to gain the ability to take shower on their own or you know improve the ability of ADLs you know versus you know athletes who are injured and a sideline as a result of having patellar tendinitis tendinosis um, and respecting that them not being able to do that is similar to people with inability to take shot on his own or her own um, is basically the idea behind it. And I wasn't so much about, you know, kind of let me cut you open and fix you. I, I, that idea being a distance runner and appreciating that change takes time, uh, for adaptation to happen yet you know human physiology is so amazing that you can train yourself to eventually become if more functional i think that recurrent theme was more evident my sort of personal sort of approach to difficult things in life uh was more obvious um palpable in in physical medicine rehab than any other subspecialty in medicine. You know, whether you're talking about spinal cord injury patient or sports, you know, patients, athletic patients trying to achieve their goal, we, you are part of this recovery process. And I enjoy the slow, gradual uh, improvement 
um, and in helping that process along the line. I think that's kind of how we, most of us, you know, PMO physiatrist or physiatrist or whatever you, want, you may want to call that, um, decide to go into this field because I think after all, we enjoy patient going from point A to point B and, you know, giving them the creative solutions to achieve that goal. So that's the reason why I picked the PMR. Um, I, I think so in advising people how you choose, you know, orthopedic surgery approach to sports medicine, family medicine approach to sports medicine or internal medicine, ER, I think you pick that based on who you are uh, and what you do and what kind of approach, you know, jives well with your personal approach to other things in life. I think yeah. it works better that way. Yeah, absolutely. That's really great advice. Um, so um, kind of to follow up, um, on your journey in sports medicine, have there been any specific cases where you really saw um, PM&R shine and have really stood out to you um, in all these years that you've been practicing? I think it still continues every day. To answer your question, I think that PMR has always practiced patient-centered care. You know, when someone says patient-centered care, it can be so many different things, and, <laughs> and it may not necessarily mean what we think the patient center means. But uh, you know, we always ask what your goal is in physical medicine rehabilitation. Even though you know, back in times when we didn't have much in the way of helping actually them, you know, at least uh, you know our sort of mentality to set, let the patient set the goal. Um, you know, I think that that is surprisingly unique. Um, you, when you watch non-PMR sports medicine practice is practiced, they're like, this is what your injuries and here's what you do. And that's not how we practice. And by practicing the way um, PMR doc, sports medicine doc um, practices, you actually become fairly um, popular <laughs> amongst the patient. And um, despite the fact that the PMR sports medicine is sort of like a newbie around the block, as far as the sports medicine service line specialists go, primary medicine guys have been around the block doing similar things for a longer time. Orthopedic surgeons are obviously arguably has a, you know, squatting rights to be that, you know, sort of like a top team physicians and, you know, professional teams and Olympic teams. Um, but when you practice medicine as a, you know, slow starter, late, late boomer, um, practicing patient centered care that we are taught to practice, you have a fighting chance to build very, very appealing practice. Um, so I might, I'm not sure if you are going to ask me that, but like over the last five, six years of when, after, you know, I finished my fellowship at Mayo Clinic, um, I'm building a practice where uh, patients seeks out uh, my care from not from just the other states in the United States, but from the, you know, completely opposite side of the globe. Uh, um, I, I think the record that I have is like, I think the patient traveled to 39 total traveling hours one way to come wow. see me. Um, and, you know, that's really was of miles. Like, a, you know, I treat one athlete and the one athlete who happens to be an Olympian talks to another athlete in other country with the same disease, the same condition. And they'll just email you like, like, and then ask you, like, can you treat me? And then I say, yes, but you got to come here. <laughs> so uh, those are happening. Um, so it's now almost weekly that I have individuals that travels minimum of 15, 20 hours to come see me. And, uh, you know, I think the PMR approach shines through, uh, but it does require a lot of patience. When you start, your colleagues probably don't understand how different you are even compared to others, primary care sports medicine physicians. And I still remember the first day I came to University of Pittsburgh and I was getting ready to go to sports medicine ground rounds in the morning. And I happened to share an elevator ride with a faculty from the orthopedic department. And he asked, who are you? What do you do? And I said, I have a new sports medicine faculty from the department of PMR. And I specialize in musculoskeletal ultrasound. And I remember him saying, wait, you're a physician, but you do therapeutic ultrasound. And I was like, not that ultrasound, <laughs> diagnostic and interventional ultrasound. But he 
obviously we, I only had 45 seconds to explain myself. So, um, so that's kind of where we started from. Um, so, you know, they didn't understand who you are. And uh, then uh, fast forward five, six years now, um, they basically count me as part of their offering and, you know, um, diagnostic ultrasound, if there's a challenging sports injury, that MRI, X-ray, CT scan fail to diagnose you, even with a EMG, and then they rely on the uh, service that I can provide. So, yeah, if I ever have someone doubting PM&R, I'm going to send them to this video because you've done a really good job of convincing us. I think that uh, PM&R is is awesome and super useful, especially in sports medicine. Mm -hmm. um, so, getting into the nitty gritty a little bit about sports medicine fellowships in PM&R. Um, you know, in your experience as a, a fellowship d director, what are you, you know, looking for in, in candidates that are interested in pursuing sports medicine? Obviously, you know, like I said, you know, PMR is a new player in sports medicine service line uh, in USA medical system. Um, and we need more of us, uh, meaning what would help us to at least establish even better um, clinical presence is to have more training program five years from now and 10 years from now. And I do have a strong bias uh, for folks who would help that process, meaning someone who has academic inclination, someone who tries to achieve goals beyond his or her own personal goal with the skill I am going to entrust him or her with. Um, so, you know, someone's goal might be like, I want to make six figures and, you know, I want to make more money. I think that's important. Um, but I, I, I think that also that, you know, whatever you are trying to achieve personally, hopefully that person can see beyond your personal goal and see the goals of the subspecialty and realize that we only have, you know, 20 plus uh, MR sports medicine fellowship. Uh, in a country, and we always have more candidates that are qualified that end up not getting matched into the sports medicine fellowship, and that's a problem. Um, so um, I, I have um, interest in training future leaders uh, in PMR sports medicine, and there's certain characteristic um, that needs to be present for that person to be a successful leader, one, the person needs to be level-headed, doesn't get flustered easily, and not really emotional. I think someone who is very, for lack of a better term, chill, laid back, um, um, those personality goes a long way in this academic sort of political hot soup. Um, whenever you put together people in this small university practice, then it's bound to have some political agenda-driven, you know, you know, turf wars and. Um, and those things happen regardless of private or academic practice, but I think academic practice tends to have a lot deeper rooted things that even though you think is some, something you have is better, that you really can't say that. <laughs> and like, I think that the person who has the ability to say that, you know what, these changes take time to happen. I'll show what I can do for the team. And then when I contribute, maybe they will finally be willing to listen to this change you suggest. So I... I think that that's a key factor that is very difficult to measure, but uh, that's something that I definitely look for. Someone who has academic aspiration, who has to intend to make our field better, um, who has patience, like a big heart patience and also endurance. I'm not saying this just because I'm a long distance runner, but um, academic career is not a sprint. <laughs> You don't show up and, and try to out sprint to everyone who is pre-existing you. Um, and, you know, you have to respect, you have to be able to respect the past, past so that you can embrace the future. And that's the word of my mentor uh, from the University of Pittsburgh, who unfortunately just passed away last year in September. Freddie Fu is his name, and he was the department uh, orthopedic chair. Um, despite the fact that he was not my department chair, he embraced my skills and my future prospect and helped me to do everything I've done here. Um, of course, along with my department chair, Dr. Gwen Soa, um, you know, but Freddie always said, you have to be able to respect the past um, uh, so that you can, you know, uh, 
draw the sort of map for the future. And um, uh, I, I don't really think we take time to ask the question, why did they make a decision to be where we are today? Uh, I think we need to make that a um, little bit more obvious so that you can learn so much from the people who were be here before you. Um, but I don't really think you, <laughs> you know, many do take time to do that. They kind of walk in and the guns are blazing, asking, this is what I think is the best. Let's change. That's not, that's not going to be received well. Um, that will be encountered with some resistance if you're talking about new sports medicine faculty. Even if you had graduated from Mayo Clinic Sports Medicine Fellowship, you're not going to walk in red car on a red carpet being asked what you know, should we should we do. No, you're going to fit in first and then you're going to figure out over time what you can contribute and how you can, uh, you, how your contribution can be improved and asking little things over time. Uh, so that, those are the characteristics I think I look for. Someone who is patient, who has goal beyond your personal goal. Yeah. What are, what are ways that you, you've seen people kind of prove to you that they've developed those skills of patience and being a leader? And, you know, obviously the interviews are only, you know, one day, so it's hard to get to know someone in that. So what are some experiences, you know, that you've seen people have that kind of nourish those characteristics? Someone who, you know, personal statement is very telling. Uh, the things they choose to highlight about their life. And if that story has a lot of, you know, um, something that will build character, that sounds very superficial, but um, that basically they carried with them for remainder of their life. Uh, and if that story, makes sense in my head. I think that might be um, one way for me to get to know them. I agree that interview is not really ideal, uh, but also, you know, interview, you know, you can tell a lot and, you know, you also happen to know a lot of people who knows them. So like a letter recommendation helps and um, yeah. So those, those are things that I look for um, in applications, so, yeah. So uh, if you're just speaking about the technicality issue of how do I look good in the application material, personal statement, and all the letters um, are my top priority. Yeah. But I'm searching for that characteristics, that someone that has special something um, that would make this field better than when he or she walked in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, trying to get to the know them over the paper as best you can. Um, I like that. Um, so kind of going more into UPMC specifically, could you talk a little bit about kind of what the fellowship looks like and, um, you know, certain topics that I think a lot of residents like to know about are, you know, continuity clinics, sport coverage, um, ultrasound experience, obviously we know that you love ultrasound, but how uh, much ultrasound experience would the fellows get, um, stuff like that. Sure. The continuity clinic is essentially time with me. So it's essentially sports ultrasound clinic. Um, so that naturally strengthened our uh, opportunity for, you know, fellowship to teach fellow high level musculoskeletal ultrasound diagnostically used and interventionally used. Uh, coverage opportunity. Um, if you know you come here on the years where the Olympic is you know being held, moving forward, there's a chance that a fellow can get involved and get to go to Olympics to provide diagnostic ultrasound services. What I've started in Tokyo Olympics was the you know the the the, the bio that you nicely you know illustrated um, is I uh, initiated IOC venue ultrasound program, and what it is is to bring the portable ultrasound machine to venues to help. Uh, the injury triage process for the Olympians. And we started this as a pilot program at the seven different venues out of, you know, 40 plus venues during Tokyo Olympics. And we've, you know, essentially um, performed 14 musculoskeletal ultrasound examinations to Olympians uh, to prove that ultrasound is highly accurate in making diagnosis without needing to transfer the patient. And this was super important during COVID. Because you know the Tokyo Olympic became the first Olympic to actually be held in the COVID bubble, so you know if we are to make a diagnosis without needing to ship that athlete out of the bubble, then we don't have to quarantine the athletes. And sometimes having have to quarantine means that person needs has to miss the next match, which can be the Olympic gold medal match. 
So ultrasound was really, really instrumental in keeping them in the bubble. Uh, but the question was, how accurate is the diagnosis? Are we making a misdiagnosis? Are we missing something? Um, and so what we did was to look for a couple of things, patient satisfaction with and without ultrasound. So we actually surveyed athletes and a uh, medical delegate of the athletes that escorted the athletes to the medical room. How did ultrasound change your impression and your trust about our diagnosis? That's clearly important because we tell them this is fractured. The question is, can this person play next match? Um, and so that was one outcome that we looked for is the increase or decrease or change in the confidence level of the diagnosis rendered to them uh, with just a clinical exam or with ultrasound. And another thing that we looked for is we followed these injured athletes throughout the uh, duration of Olympics, which is about two weeks. And if they had done advanced imaging subsequent to ultrasound examination, then we can compare uh, ultrasound findings to um, X-ray or MRI, whatever it is, uh, that's still considered a gold standard and see how accurate the diagnosis was. As it turns out, diagnostic accuracy was 100%. Um, so the, the Olympic researchers were impressed uh, and um, the hope is to bring this back in next Summer Olympics in Paris um, to bring it to not just the seven venues, but every venues. I believe it, there are going to be 52 venues. Um, so say like our fellow starting in uh, summer of um, 2024, right? There's a chance that person gets to go to Paris, start the fellowship in Paris. Not a bad place to start. So, you know, coverage, <laughs> you know, sign me up, right? right. So, so that's one. And in terms of standard coverage, I am a team physician for Division I uh, private university, uh, Christian University here in the city, uh, city of Pittsburgh uh, called Duquesne University. And um, uh, we've uh, recently uh, completed several million dollar renovation of all the athletic facilities to move into high performance uh, models. Um, and we have uh, fantastic athletic trainers and the conditioning strengthening coaches to actually change, you know, sort of the old mentality of we are just one of the division schools, one schools to we want to be one of the top contenders in national championship in many sports. So that's part great, you know, environment to be in. And an additional benefit of that um, fact that the you know, university is located in the center of the city is to cover those events. You don't have to actually even drive. A lot of times you can walk over to the game and that saves a lot of time uh, for our fellows. And unlike those, you know, uh, fellowship that caters to professional athletes, let's say a basketball team or a baseball team, you're not limited to single sports. Duquesne has over 20 athletic teams. So, you know, you get to see cross country runners, uh, javelin throwers, tennis players, lacrosse players, soccer injuries, volleyball, you know, basketball, men's and women's. We added uh, tumbling as a sport this year, which is basically gymnastics minus all those fancy other bars and pommel horses. It's kind of weird. Tumbling is a division one sports now. And also the triathlon uh, is a new sports that we are adding. So, um, you know, you get to see variety of injury patterns. And I think that's an important part of training. And besides, it's not also professional team either. So you actually get to be the frontline uh, care provider to these athletes being truly a part of the decision making as opposed to watching your attending or PD make a decision for you. So, so those are, I think, the strengths in terms of coverage and ultrasound exposures. In addition to, you know, standard training, the AMSSM, um, American Medical Society for Sports Medicine um, recommends for the fellows as, a, you know, um, weekly, you know, training curriculum, longitudinal curriculum throughout the fellowship, that's the easy one to provide it, you know, and I, I understand that some fellowships are still unable to provide that due to lack of, you know, experience in faculties with ultrasound. We provide that, but in addition, uh, we have a strong international presence in ultrasound, sports ultrasound related researches. So I've established four years ago, a uh, research fellowship amongst Japanese orthopedic surgeons who are typically a head physician for national teams, such as rugby or gymnastics, uh, that also have MD, uh, the PhD addition to MD, that would come here to spend about a year with us, with me, 
Um, and the purpose of this research fellowship is to um, develop ultrasound guided surgical procedures. So the first fellow, Dr. Soichi Hattori, uh, was a physician for Team Japan Rugby, but he had an interest in developing ultrasound guided anterior telofibular ligament repair. And he developed this and using the University of Pittsburgh facility here uh, in the robotic research laboratory. We have this uh, fancy device called the Six Degree of Freedom Robotic Machine, where you can actually load the canaveric ankle joint and load them in such a fashion with the known amount of force and torque. So we can make comments on how stable this ankle joint is when it's intact after we create an injury of ATFL and then repairing it. So we can actually make comments whether the ultrasound guided ATFL repair is biomechanically sound and how does it compare to intact ankle. So we just finally had the paper accepted to OJSM um, and it should be coming out. But because we had the data for now two years, um, um, our team has already performed this procedure to actual patient and athletes. Uh, now we are reaching about 20 people reaching six months mark. And what's remarkable is, I don't know if you know anything about ATFL repair surgically done, but uh, usually ATFL repair results in 10% complication rate if you are to do uh, standard open surgery, nerve injuries and wound adhesions and infections and all of that accounts about 10%, which is high. Uh, but ultrasound guided repair so far has resulted in zero complication. And then two, uh, in terms of functional return and outcome, uh, whatever the open surgery achieves and takes 12 months for, we can do it with ultrasound guidance because of a small incision uh, in six months. So it cuts the return to sports time to half. And of course, this is not head-to-head -head comparison. So we have to do you know, randomized tri trials to truly say that, but we know what happens after you know, open surgery. We have enough data to do the, uh, make comments on that, but it's looking far promising compared to open surgery in terms of um, complication rate and functional outcome at six months. So, you know, you, as a fellow, you get to see these research evolving. And this year we, we have a goal to establish ultrasound guided meniscus repair. Wow, that's incredible. So we are working on that and it's looking really promising. So we are pushing the edge uh, for next generation ultrasound guided procedures. I know people talk about 10X and, you know, taking that tissue out using, you know, uh, or a couple ton of release doing sonics procedures, you know, cutting things is much easier skill-wise than completing uh, suturing on their skin. Uh, but then my mentor from Mayo Clinic, Dr. Jay Smith, um, Dr. Jonathan Finoff, Dr. Jake Sellen, all these three people uh, have always thought that, you know, a step up beyond cutting things, releasing things using 10X or Sonex is repairing things. And as they are, you know, former student, obviously my goal is to carry the torch to the next level. So this is getting accomplished, not by myself, but in conjunction with orthopedic surgeons. So I think that's extremely unique aspect where we have a true collegial relationship with uh, our orthopedic colleagues. Um, people talk about multidisciplinary care of sports medicine, but I think we go beyond that and we call this transdisciplinary approach to sports medicine. And transdisciplinary means we transcend our primary specialty to start thinking like each other. For example, our orthopedic surgeons ask me if I can say a word, can you do this under ultrasound guidance? So they are understanding what the advantage of ultrasound is in sports medicine and they are forthcoming about suggesting it. So that's the difference between simply practicing together in the same physical space, which most places do, but do they actually refer a patient to each other? <laughs> Uh, um, transdisciplinary is needed uh, for us to have more forthcoming uh, relationship and that we have that as a general culture at the University of Pittsburgh and this is all thanks to Freddie, uh, Dr. Freddie Fu obviously who basically embraced um, any opportunity to give a chance to anyone who deserves it. Um, um, I don't know if you know anything about Freddie but he was a department chair of orthopedic surgery here at the University of Pittsburgh for 25 plus years. 
He's written 500 original ACL research articles, and his studies have been referenced 50,000 times in his lifetime. Wow. Um, so that's that's a type of caliber of a guy. But then his greatness is not seen so all these academic accomplishment, but um, his ability to build the bridges and connect people who are talented. And his, you know, legacy is well felt still to this day. So. Yeah, that's awesome. And obviously UPMC has a great reputation for research, but it's nice to hear kind of exactly what you guys are doing, at least a little part of it and what the sports medicine uh, department is like. So um, thank you for that insight. Um, my next question is, so I actually, I am a little bit familiar with Pittsburgh because I actually went to Carnegie Mellon for my undergrad and I oh, know- Oh, CMU, awesome. Yeah, <laughs> I know, you know, a lot of the, the sites are quite a ways away from each other. So I was wondering um, what sites specifically would the sports medicine fellow rotate at? You know, I know there's the new, new Lemieux Center in the suburbs and then there's the place at, uh, in the South side. So kind of, can you talk a little bit about the sites? Sure. So I, for those folks who are not familiar with Pittsburgh geographics, so obviously Pittsburgh is central to all of the sites that we are talking about. So I live in the city of Pittsburgh in Squirrel Hill uh, area yeah, yeah. Um, and pretty close to where you went to college. And yeah. um, I, about, I drive about 25, 30 minutes to go to Lemieux and that's my main clinical site. And that's where obviously the fellow comes to work with. But fellow also gets to rotate with uh, uh, orthopedic surgeons and sport, uh, primary care sports medicine physicians at Southside uh, Sports Medicine Complex, which is about 10 minutes south of, or five minutes, 10 minutes from where I live. So, uh, you know, fellows kind of, you know, basically, basically are either 25, 30 minute north of the city or, you know, five, 10 minutes drive from anywhere in the city. That's the kind of distance, uh, you know, sort of what you're looking at for clinical experiences. And it, you, as you know, Duquesne is located in the center of the city. So if you happen to choose to live near downtown because you like the you know happening scenes and bustling downtown, then you could essentially walk over to the game coverage. And also as a fellow too, you get your personal ultrasound to take home wow. to. And it's not one of those pocketable ultrasound like a butterfly or a lumify. It's a true, uh, clinical grade uh, machine from Konica Minolta. It's called the HS1. It comes with 18 megahertz linear frequency transducer and elastography plus color Doppler. So it comes with all the whistles and bells. Um, wow, that is a huge perk. Lots of practice with that, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, so those are the two sites that you know people rotate with. Um, let me, which houses two full size ice link, you know, I, you know, ice link for the hockey and, and then um, the South side of sports medicine complex now was renamed after Freddie Foo. So it's a Freddie Foo sports complex, oh, wow. uh, That's yeah, awesome. which is located next to um, a Steelers practice field. So South side sports medicine in conjunction with uh, Steelers franchise and the north side, uh, the Cranberry, the Lemieux Sports Complex in conjunction with uh, Pittsburgh Penguins franchise. So those are the two state-of-the-art facilities that you know uh, red fo fe fellows rotate with. And we have, um, I think, three uh, ultrasound machine that costs $350,000 wow. in these two locations, plus some you know less expensive ones. but. We have enough to go around to have it every single examination rooms basically of yeah. numerous high functioning ultrasound machines yeah. plus you know digital x-ray mri and ct stuff so it's a full service sports medicine complex awesome yeah I've, I've been to both and i can definitely vouch that they're definitely state of the art and and very beautiful and they have all the bells and whistles so yeah. awesome um just a few more questions so um what are kind of career opportunities looking like after fellowship? Um, what are you seeing your fellows go into? And, and um, kind of the question that isn't asked a lot, what can people expect compensation to be like in sports medicine? Yeah, so to answer your question, what has my fellow been doing? Uh, hopefully they're helping people, number one. <laughs> number two, uh, so earlier fellows have gone into private practice. Um, my first three or four fellows have gone into private practice. 
most of these people have come from coastal states, Florida and California. And academic practice is kind of difficult to establish in those areas. Just living cost is kind of expensive and the private practice obviously tends to have higher income. So besides, you know, these people are mostly selected while I was the assistant program director. I was the assistant director for the first year, three years I was here and I took over the program subsequent to it. And you can actually see the trajectory changing from that point on. Prime, pro, former uh, program director was Dr. Jose Ramirez del Toro who was an interesting Puerto Rican national basketball team, <laughs> uh, really great basketball player, but he, he had the hybrid private practice, academic practice practice when he was the program director. And our graduates took after his sort of mold, professional mold and went into private practice. And as soon as I took over the program, I basically made it very academic. <laughs> and everyone else that actually, I had a chance to pick on uh, the you know, match. Uh, went into uh, academic practice. So the places they've gone to, uh, one stayed here at the University of Pittsburgh, actually two now, uh, most recent graduate Ryan Nuzibam, who went to Charlie Ryan Ability uh, Lab for the residency, came here as a fellow and stayed on as a faculty. So he's actually starting in next week as a new attending. It's kind of okay. weird to see, you know, your former trainee now practicing on his own. Uh, Alison Bean, uh, former, uh, you know, Macklin Outstanding Resident Award winner from American, you know, Academic Physiatry AAP. Um, she has been here as faculty pursuing a career as an, you know, clinician scientist studying muscle stem cells. Um, and um, in between the two is uh, Marianne Lutmore, uh, who completed her medical school residency at Mayo Clinic, Rochester, and came here for fellowship. Uh, she returned to Mayo Clinic. So she's an academic physician at Mayo Clinic Rochester. So, I mean, you can tell that most recent three that I you know, had a sort of, you know, final say in <laughs> yeah. went into academic practice. So likely that, you know, I mean, I'm not really like holding that against them. Like I'm happy if they are happy. So if they end up choosing a private practice, then that's fine as well. Um, but they end up choosing the academic practice and Hopefully they will build their own fellowship or become involved in existing fellowship and hopefully, you know, they will help build the future uh, generations of, you know, fellows uh, or build the research, um, you know, findings to increase the credibility to the PMR sports docs. And uh, in terms of the compensation, um, so I, I think generally speaking, private practice compensates better. I think the sky's the limit. I think there are a couple of people that are making over, you know, like million uh, being a PMR doc in private practice in some of the desirable locations. Um, and then th you look at the um, average salary for academic physicians and they, I think it ranges anywhere from like a 200,000 to 250,000, somewhere there, depending on the years of experiences. Um, so that's really the range I think you're looking at if you're looking to stay in academia, but that's really the salary that comes from your clinical and academic contribution, and you can always supplement your income with, you know, doing other consultation services, work, workers' compensation, you know, qualified examinations for work with injuries, and so there are ways that to supplement, so, you know, that's that sort of base salary is, you know, maybe I can give the number 200 or so that kind of hovers around 200, 220,000 starting in academia. So that range is big, right? 200 yeah. to a million. <laughs> big range. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, awesome. And um, my last question for you is just where do you see the, for the future of sports medicine going? It depends on how other people do, you know, I really can't do it, do it all. So Hopefully yeah. people get inspired and excited and start doing, you know, things that would be good for other people that follows you. Um, and a goal is to find those exclusive talent that somehow like, you know, you can't seem to, you know, drop these people. They are so motivated. They want to learn. They want to, you know, do things, you know, beyond their personal goals. And I think, I don't really think you can teach that. Um, so we just have to do a better job finding these people and give those people a chance, even if that person happens to not look superstar on the paper. Usually you find these talents because I mean, I went to University of uh, California Irvine program, which has no sports medicine services back then. Wow. So, um, 
you know, in fact, when I applied to Mayo Clinic Fellowship as an applicant, and at that time, there are only 12 spots in the nation for PMR candidates to match to long time ago. Um, I did not have a single sport coverage uh, experience on my CV, zero. I didn't cover anything. So, you know, um, I, I, I think that, you know, that wasn't because of my choosing. I didn't really simply have opportunities. I didn't have any senior residents in my program that was going into sports medicine either. So I just didn't know. <laughs> um, so I, you know, feel like, um, I think that we need to just do, uh, you know, better job, like just as Mayo gave me a chance, even though I wasn't, you know, typical candidate, I should say. I think, you know, you know, I think if we do a great job, then I think the future of PMR sports medicine is great. And there are people like Dr. Jonathan Finoff, uh, who I just had a chance to talk to yesterday, last night. He was at Mayo when I was at Mayo. Now he's at Team USA uh, Olympics. He's a uh, chief medical officer for Team um, USA Olympics and Paralympics. Um, so PMR sports medicine physician is the chief medical officer for entire team uh, USA delegation. Uh, so the future is looking bright. There are some earlier signs that, you know, PMR sports medicine docs are one of the best, you know, specialties to go into to lead people. But I think we need more of, you know, Jonathan, Jonathan Finoff. <laughs> <laughs> so we just have to do a better job finding and if we do a good job I think we'll do well absolutely well that's all my questions and I really appreciate you taking the time to be here with me today and um, we're so happy to have you so thank you so much oh thank you so much